or whatever yeah. Yeah, feel free to interrupt. Okay. Yeah. Can we do a quick roundtable to see who we are? Plus, like all the names? Yeah, let's yeah. play that. So, I'm Yoav. I'm a beekeeper in, uh, in the Laurentians. I do some projects in Montreal. I'm, I'm interested in to see how colony monitoring could help the bees. I'm Daniel. Hello. Uh, I do uh, GD concepts and now I do uh, uh, fabrications. Um, I'm a right now, it's the new part. 3D printer, is it? So, there are any prototypes to be made? Oh, cool. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jeremy. Uh, I'm the keeper, as you say, in Portland, Oregon. It's my brother, so uh -huh. I kind of helped start this project. Yeah, I'm yeah, so we're going on a product together. I'm in the University in Bioresource Engineering, and uh, I don't do these, so I'm interested in that modern. I'm actually looking at these. Uh, my name is Tibi. Um, I studied the physics, optics, and for the present, I'm, I'm Daniel, and other people here. Doing sensors, and we're trying to see how sensors are going to fit. Actually, we're trying to Larry uh, Sensorica and, and uh, other groups, um, the intelligent behind group and Pharmac, uh, trying to see how sensors we will be able to fit into these applications. Uh -huh. I'm Nancy. Um, I just keep Frank company. <laughs> Actually, she has a, uh, a she has a startup business. With, um, she's too modest to mention it, <laughs> but she has a startup business. She noticed this. She noticed that beehives are basically ugly. <laughs> and we were in um, Paris last winter, and we saw the bee school in the Luxembourg Gardens, mm -hmm. and they have these hexagonal copper beehive covers. So Nancy has a hexagonal copper beehive cover business that's starting up. And we have we have prototypes. <laughs> Looking for sales. <laughs> so if you know anybody with more money than friends, who's <laughs> interested? More money than what? No. Who's, who's more interested in aesthetics than profit from their bee house? That, that would be the way to do it. Urban beekeeper. Yeah, urban beekeeper. Backyard, urban backyard beekeeper. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Frank Linton. Um, Thanks, for, thanks for, for, for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, um, I'll, I'll give you more background about this stuff. But my, I was introduced to bees by my grandfather, who was a beekeeper in Vermont, and uh, studied mechanical engineering in, in, in college, and then um, computer science, artificial intelligence, and stuff like that. So I'm not really an expert on monitoring, but I, I'd like to see, I see a need for Colony monitor, and that's what I'm. That's what I'm about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my name is Jane Stanhope, and I'm affiliated with these two across the table. Um, during the day, I do ebook readers, but I'm an enthusiast, a bee enthusiast. So I'm very happy to be here. Thanks. Uh, I'm uh, Emmanuel, and um, I'm part of the board member of uh, NB Keeper. For uh, Miel Montréal, which is uh, a cooperative, uh, non-profit, cooperative and non-lucrative, and a non-profit oriented cooperative, and uh, we're we're doing mainly uh, we're setting up hives, but we're also doing uh, uh, training and also uh, uh, also lots of things with education in schools and things like that. I'm, I'm more on the uh, beekeepers uh, side. I was taking care of the hives that were on the Congrès, on uh, La Tevue, another place, and a few other places uh, was uh, as good thing advice. I'll have many years of background as a beekeeper, but it ended up as a as I've been thrown in all this project. As I now I'm getting more experience, but as really in the urban setting of uh, the beehives, 
And uh, on the personal side, I'm, a, I'm an artist, I'm a dancer, I do other, other topics, but, uh, and I work with uh, some multimedia, but uh, now I'm, I'm trying to already uh, gearing myself and getting my little uh, Arduino and things like that to uh, try to hook up some data and just trying to retrieve the most data we can just from the, the beehive for sure that some, uh, some some that some some meaning would arise uh, eventually from just gathering from the print base of, of gathering the data, but uh, on the other on the other hand, I think these, these data can be used as much as uh, help or be able to not uh, bother the bee as much, but as well as from a, really an art perspective, it was really possible to gather that uh, from a, like from sounds or from uh, just uh, or from seeing the, the small fluctuations and. Uh, and uh, we have some opportunity of it with Mount Montreal and with the partners that we're having. There's uh, definitely some beehives that can uh, that could be like uh, uh, subjects uh, for, for this. Um, we have a good relationship with the uh, Tori, where we have one hive, and the one director there is the one who made uh, like uh, put the sensors on the prison in the north. Uh, in La Concepcion, there's like a huge uh, high security prison with. Uh, like floor sensors and things like that, and he set up a few weather networks, and he was willing to help us uh, putting up the hive. But he talks a lot, but uh, but I, I see uh, for, for sure there's an interest in, in a few of those. And I, when I heard about this project, I I wanted to for sure uh, um, jump in, but I'm really uh, trying to understand still what is. Uh, not the structure, but what is uh, or how is it oriented? I know there was a talk about beehive monitoring, but uh, I'm still trying to figure out how it works. So, is there a goal behind it, or what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Hi, I'm John. Uh, I'm a electrical engineer. I make circuits for fun. Uh, <laughs> Passing the sensors for a long time, and I've been looking for an excuse to make an acoustic sensor for a really long time. And when I heard that these the oh. frequency matters, I was so excited. So I'm gonna I can't wait to make a some kind of sound to frequency analysis. And also to integrate this whole system together. I'm really excited to make automated VI automated. Huh? So that's fine. We also have gas here, uh which are gas online. Uh, I'm also waiting for a fire who's with um, digital Open source. Open source behind community, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so if you want to speak, um, just unmute yourself because I'm usually. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I'm usually in Montreal, but right now I'm in San Francisco. I'm a student at Concordia, I'm doing my MBA, and uh, I've been with Sensorica for about six months. Um, I've kind of missed out on the introduction, so I'm not sure what was discussed, but I'm working on essentially. Um, various different business aspects um, at Sensorica, including governance, um, how to commercialize products, um, and also how do you sort of manage community of different innovators and innovation. So um, <coughs> how do you facilitate rather? So um, in this project, again, I'm still waiting to see where it advances. I'm going to be just listening in. But I'm very interested in seeing how various different projects come together. Um, I'm also not sure if someone's talked about Sanfavi, which is going to be our space moving forward in March or April. We're launching this project with the government of Quebec and a bunch of other partners to sort of provide space for innovators to come and sort of experiment, sort of like a playground uh, based on the model of Sensorica. Um, I'll wait until this community sort of uh, to hear more and then I'll listen more. Once there's an opportunity, I'll talk more about that. Yeah, I don't know if you if it was clear for you. Yeah, uh, I'll, I can quickly summarize. Yeah, if you uh, don't mind, Yasir. Uh, Yasir is an MBA student who's been uh, working with us for a couple months now, six months or so. Six months. And what he's trying to do is help commercialize these products, find ways of commercializing these community-based ideas, and uh, governance. How we can govern the, uh, I guess, the sharing of resources and the sharing of revenue. Sharing of revenue, of course, uh, and to get community engagement. And also, he was mentioning the sound of the V, which is something we'll have to be talking about a little later, which is our new space. Right? Mm -hmm. And he's, he's also working hard on integrating different open communities yeah. together into larger networks of uh -huh. Okay. Shall I go ahead? Yeah. Okay.
So hi. <laughs> uh, the, uh, this is a, a this is sort of describes my thinking about how I how I got started on a colony health uh, monitoring system. I mean, bees don't call in sick. Right? That that is not what happens. In fact, when I tried to make sense of that picture, I, I couldn't understand it. And then I said, well, from a beekeeper's perspective, it's just stupid, right? <laughs> bees don't call in sick, right? They're already there. So I, I finally understood it when I said, okay, well, I go to a day job, and if I get sick, then I call in sick. Okay, it makes sense from an office worker perspective, but it makes no sense from a beekeeping perspective. But if you want to know if your colony is sick, then what do you do? So um, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, everything on the screen for yeah. 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 Uh, the, I'm a, the lo my local beekeeping club is the Beekeepers Association of uh, Northern Virginia, BAMB, and my state beekeeping club is the Virginia State Beekeepers Association, and then the regional club is the Eastern Apicultural Society, which is 26 states and provinces, including uh, Quebec, is actually a member of the Eastern Apicultural Society. And these, these names that I mentioned are, are, are people who are particularly helpful uh, to me that, that local beekeepers would know, but I, I don't expect you to. Um, I got started in this concept when this uh, guy that I work with, Alan Fiala, sent a message to our local list, me, list. He said, I discovered my best colony was dead. And I was so um, inexperienced at beekeeping, I didn't know that was normal. So I thought, hmm, that's a real problem. How, how can we prevent it? And you know, if I'm driving my car down the road um, and there's a problem with the engine, the check engine light comes on. But if my beehive has a problem, I don't get a check hive light. But that's what I would like is a check, check beehive light. <laughs> um, so, so how could we have something like that? What would, what would that sense or sense? And there's, there's things that it could sense but they have to tell you something. So there's a bunch of possibilities there. Um, oh, yeah, so this is, oh, I forgot my joke here. This is, so Alan Fiala's message to the list, I discovered my best hive was dead. Okay, so here's, here's the beehive out there. And my suggestion is keep them in boxes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, you may have heard of this person, um, Vickery, I don't know if any of you, uh, he's Canadian. Um, that he was doing some experiments um, years ago, overwintering nukes, these nuke boxes, and you can see all the wires that he had. And he wired these up with temperature sensors so he could see what was going on um, in the colonies over the course of the winter. And that works just fine if you're not inspecting the colonies or moving them around and so on. You know, keep them keep them in one place for six months. Great, yeah. but but for for and, and that was the technology of the time. So that's that's you know, an early sensing uh, uh, work, but um, but it, it doesn't work uh, in, in modern circumstances. Um, also, when I first started looking around, I came across on, on the web for people who are doing this kind of thing. I discovered this company called Apatronics, which I believe was a Quebec company. But it, by the time I found their website, it had already gone out of business. But they had a great logo, Monitor Your Hives From Home, which I thought was just, yeah, that's what I want to do. And that's, that's my vision, is a colony health monitoring system that provides a true warning of trouble, trouble before it happens, using economical, cheap, wireless sensor network. That's, when we have that, we're, we're in great shape. And I, my, my, my role in that, the one I assigned myself, is to be a market creator, to bring buyers and sellers together. And the way I'm going about that is playing around today with whatever I can do cheaply by myself, keeping in touch with the research, uh, with the understanding that what's uh, possible today is cheap tomorrow, and keeping in mind that um, you can't, you can't um, be a good beekeeper by technology alone. You have to understand bees. So the monitoring supplements your hands-on experience. You can't, you can't tell anything. So logically, if you were going to go about this, 
Um, you'd say, okay, what's the problem that I want to detect? What are the symptoms of that problem? What are the sensors that would tell me that problem was happening? And then you'd create a solution around it. So if the problem was robbing, say, hmm, robbing, well, the hive is probably going to lose weight very quickly. Uh, there's probably going to be some fighting on the landing board, which could be detected maybe with audio, maybe with video, and you build those things. But I didn't do that. I, I, I did the, if you've ever heard of the parking lot solution, which is you look, wherever you lost your keys to the, your car, you look where the light is. Because <laughs> that's where the light is. So instead of where you lost it. So I said, well, okay, what can I monitor? Well, I can monitor syrup consumption because I feed the bees. I can uh, monitor the weight. I can monitor uh, the temperature easily. Uh, I can monitor audio. I can monitor the visual appearance. But then, given those things, how do I correlate or predict those to the to, to hive health? So that's the, the essentially the task I assigned um, myself. Um, and in, in terms of what does the research show as possible, uh, it seems you have to know quite a lot here. You have to know things about bees to know what to monitor. You have to know a lot about sensor technology to know how to monitor it. You have to know about power and communications because beehives are out, out there somewhere. And you can connect wire power and, and, and sensor wires to them. That's one thing. But that's, and, and that's okay in the research phase, but it's not in a practical phase. The people who are most concerned about this will be people who are beyond the Wi-Fi uh, network. The analysis part is uh, interpreting what the meaning of the numbers is. If my hive is gaining weight or losing weight, that could be good or bad, just depending on the time of year, what the other hives around it are doing, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then reporting, how do you report what the numbers mean? Uh, it would be interesting to have examples like a report that the brood chamber is full and hive number 23. If you could do that, that would be just super. Um, and there are lots of examples out there, and I'll show you a few. Feel free to interrupt me with questions or arguments or, or whatever as I go along. Um, examples of Cheap Tomorrow. Seems like you folks are probably all more familiar with this than, 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 than everybody. The price of things comes down. So as things are mass produced, they get cheaper and cheaper. Um, I remember when digital cameras were $100 per megapixel. And I said, when they get down to $50 per megapixel, I'll buy one. Last weekend, I saw one in a store. It was 20 megapixels for $99. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, that's just, the price just comes down real over time. This is my apiary <laughs> and my experimental laboratory. It's one two-frame, two-deep-frame observation hive. This, uh, this, in the, when this picture was taken, it was sitting in my guest bedroom. Uh, you can see the feeder on one end and the tube going out the window on the other end. Um, that's where I did a lot, most of this work. Not all of it, but most of it. Uh, this is the outside entrance, just made, made out of a few two by fours, so it fits in the window without modifying the window. Um, it's, you can see it in the house there. <coughs> and it's the, it's that window there. And so people don't even notice it. Even, even beekeepers who are coming to my house who know I have an observation hive will walk up to the house and not, not see it until I point it out to them. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes there's a cluster of bees there and then they'll notice. <laughs> uh, the, the nice thing about an observation hive is you can see everything the bees are doing. So you can correlate what the temperatures, what the sensor readings are with what the bee behavior is. And I won't go through all the details there, but there's a lot of there's a lot of things that these do, and so it, that makes it nice for correlating. Um, and even you can see down, like here, you can see down inside the cell where the bee is is working with the honey, right down inside the tip of the honeycomb. And that's the kind of thing you can't see with a normal beehive, but it's, it's just really nice if you have an observation hive. And I have a whole separate talk on observation hives, which I, which I will not tell you about. Um, okay, so what can I monitor? These are some of the things I'm monitoring. I'll show you the details on these. Um, so this is this is syrup consumption, and so I've got a year across the bottom down here, and this is 
pounds per day, <coughs> pounds per day of syrup consumed on a monthly average. Okay, and in this particular case, I've got two years of data. I started with that observation hive. I restarted the observation hive with essentially one frame of bees, of jams with bees in October, and you can see that the syrup they consumed in October was about a quarter of a pound per day, and it dropped and <coughs> dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. Typically in my part of the country in January, the queen starts laying eggs again, um, but not a lot. The first nectar flow is in April. Okay? So you can see this, this hive just kept consuming less and less and less and less syrup. But it, and then finally in, in June it took off. In July it slacked off a little bit. In August something happened, it dropped off again. And then in September it consumed a lot of honey again. Um, so taking a look at the events here, this was, as I say, it started with a full frame of bees. And finally, in the middle of April, it had gotten down to just that one little, just like a hand, handful of bees. It was amazing they survived. If they'd been outside, they, would, they wouldn't have survived. But they, this, this was a, a swarm that uh, somebody was going to just combine or lose, and they just gave it to me. And, and it apparently wasn't a very healthy swarm going into the group. Um, and they lost a lot of bees. Uh, here they are in August. They finally took off. All right, they jammed that hive right full. This is a picture of both sides of the hive. Um, so you can see they, were, they just had jammed, they were jammed full of bees in August. Okay. At this point, they were consuming the syrup jar. They consumed that jar in a day. Right. So then the next picture is one week later, and it's empty. <laughs> okay, there's brood in there, brood on the bottom frame. But almost all the bees are gone. It swarmed in August, which is very late in the year for hives to swarm, but it did swarm. That was a four pound swarm of bees out of a two frame hive, which is a four pound is a normal swarm from a 10 or 20 frame hive. <laughs> from a two frame is quite a um, So, okay, then the next year, so that fall, and that was August, right? August there, right? August, here's where they swarmed. Then they rebuilt themselves starting the following year. They didn't lose as much weight over the winter, which was good. They started growing and consuming syrup in February, which was good. March, great. April, they dropped off for some reason. I'll show you why. May, even less. And then June and July. Okay. So in April, what happened is with an observation hive, with, no, with a normal hive, the bees can cluster to keep them. With an observation hive, they cannot. And so I let the house get too cold because I went away on vacation. You see all that brood up there? That's all dead. They were, they were raising brood like crazy. And then I let the house get too cold because I was away. And I almost killed that house. These, these, these are the few bees that were left down there. And they did survive. But, but that was, uh, that's, that's why the consumption dropped off. What are those white squares? The white squares. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump ahead in the talk. Um, the, this is a temperature sensor box, a wireless temperature indoor-outdoor thermometer. And that spot right there is where the sensor is. Okay. And then these squares, I was measuring, also measuring the temperature with an infrared thermometer in every one of those, those 16 different spots on, on both sides. So that's what that is. Um, So that's, this was, uh, what would I say, from one, one month later, okay, so I swapped temperature sensors out and I removed the lower one and put in this different, a different kind of temperature sensor. Um, but that's, that's, so I split the, so I split, I split the, I removed the queen in the top frame, changed the thermometer. So these bees now had to raise their own queen. So that really slowed them down. That was what I wanted to do because they, they expand until this high really fast. Okay, so what can you say about feed? Oh, so the second year, that was what happened here. They took off real good in January. I almost killed them in April. I, they recovered. I split them in May. In June, July, you can see they, they, they took some food. But, but basically, I think the conclusion here is what you can see from just monitoring the feed consumption is you can tell things like the start of brood rearing, when they start consuming more, 
You can tell if they run out of food because they start taking the, the, the feed. Um, you can tell the start of a nectar flow because they prefer nectar to syrup. So they'll, they'll, there'll be a drop in consumption rate. Um, and you may be able to know the start and the end of the fall nectar flow, maybe. Um, and possibly unexpected events like, like killing off the bees, things like that that you didn't, want, didn't really want to do. Okay. But the trouble is with this data by itself is it's ambiguous. You really can't tell what's going on uniquely from this kind of data. But it's easy to gather, so, so it's worth doing. Even if, you, um, even if you just have a full empty or just an empty sensor on your, on your feed jar, at least that tells you when you're out of feed. And you know when you refill it, so it gives you it gives you something that's fairly, fairly easy to measure, and um, uh, and, it, and it tells you something, though not a whole heck of a lot. Uh, the next thing I tried to do was weigh the hive. So I've got an indoor, just an indoor bathroom scale here that weighs to the nearest tenth of a pound, and uh, I, I, these boxes just keep the hive up so that this tube goes down toward the window. Okay because at night moisture condenses in that tube and it would either run down into the hive or out the window, which is what I wanted it to do. So those boxes are just there for that. But, but sitting, on the, sitting on the scale is this board, and so it made it very easy to just measure the weight of the hive every day and it weighs to the nearest tenth of a pound. So here's a couple of years of hive weight data, and it's weekly average, so it, um, you can see again, it's the same from, from October through September. You can see the weight drops off until May, that first year, then it built up. Here's what happened when I replaced the, um, I replaced the frame of brood or the frame of foundation. Here the hive reached its maximum weight, stayed there for a couple of weeks, and swarmed. That's the swarm right there. Okay. They recovered. The following year, they started off much healthier. They were in much better shape, four pounds heavier in terms of Bees and stores, and they dropped off weight. Um, really, I would have liked to have seen them start gaining weight earlier, but they didn't. They started gaining weight in March. Uh, here's where I almost killed them, and then here's where I split. And then I just kept removing frames of brood uh, to keep the to keep them from swarming, just by removing the excess brood. So. So high weight tells you quite a lot about what's going on in the hive. And there's a lot of other people who are doing high weight monitoring. Um, here's, a, here's a scale you can buy right now for only $1,500 from Bwise. Um, got four weight sensors and a cell phone connection, and you pay extra for the, the solar and the battery. Pack. But it's, it's available on the web. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's there. You can buy one today. It's, I'm not sure why you would. <laughs> well, uh, commercial low sensors are very expensive. Is they're, that? They're yeah. always that. Like okay. those little metal puffs they sell. Yep. Yep. They're in the five hundred dollar range. Okay. So, so what do what do the bathroom scales do then? They get them down to be so cheap. Yeah, I guess the range is different, right? You go from you're never more than two or three hundred pounds. Right? Yeah. You yep. just go up to thousands of pounds. Yeah. Um, and the it seems to me that the real problem with the bathroom scales is they have to be zeroed every time. Yeah. So if somebody could solve that problem somehow. I was going to ask that question, yeah. actually. How do you calibrate yeah. every time? Yeah, well, I, I, because the hive isn't sitting there, and it's a lightweight hive, I just pick up the hive with one hand, start <laughs> okay. the scale, and then I can lower the hive onto right. the scale. Right. So it's easy at home in my, yeah. in my guest bedroom where the hive is. But I, Honestly, I, I don't know, because if you use an analog scale, it's a spring scale, the spring will stretch. Yeah. Yep. And then yep. the, the strain gauge based ones, like the bathroom scales, yep. those will drift. Yeah. Is it that they use an absolute bottom for one pound? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. We'll have to try. What if I, what if I put a cement, what if I got two bathroom scales and put a cement block on one that I move away and then use that? Would, would the drift be the same on both scales? So. Okay. I'd so. put a little pin or something. You just pull, press the pin in and then turn on the scale and pull the pin out and it just drops. Uh huh. Well, you've still got to raise and lower yeah. the, the, the hive or the scale. Yeah. yeah. I, I just want to take a few seconds here. Yeah. I acknowledge that Aaron is there. So okay. he's with the um, open source AI community. Right? He's oh, the great. Uh, great. Awesome. So he's, he's just listening in. And at some point, if you want to jump in, um, yeah, just 
If you have questions, feel free to ask questions. Aaron. So this is, is, is a, it's a tough technical problem, yeah. but a very useful. If somebody could solve this, they'd have they'd have something that, that they could sell. Uh -huh. We can just buy cheap load sensors from China. Uh huh. Just similar, the same technology, but cheaper version. And what about the drift problem? Well, uh, one thing that I found was that they they have the strain gauges. You get like up to a thirty kilo strain gauge for uh -huh. like seventy dollars on uh -huh. eBay. Uh -huh. And if you were to set up a uh, an amount for the hive that just distributed the weight over I don't know, maybe 16 different points. Mm -hmm. You could drop the weight on each point to yeah. less than 15 kilos. Uh -huh. And a lot of those strain gauges I saw, if they were under 15 kilos, they said they'd be very resistant to creep. Really? So if you mm -hmm. just distributed mm -hmm. enough, uh -huh. and you can have just a single 70 dollars strain gauge. Oh, so you could put a put a put a bunch of them around. Just have a whole bunch of blocks, and only yeah. one of them be the actual gauge. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. huh. Oh. With that, you can actually know where the weight distribution is, too. If you want to see another load at yeah. once. Then oh. And then you'd send that data, you read the gauge, and send it through a, you know, a uh, circuit. A lot of those load cells, at least the ones I saw, they, they have USB load cells. Wow. Uh, I, mean, I found that they have USB load cells on eBay. Really? 30, wow. Yeah, 30 kilos, $70. Uh-huh. Mm. Well, boy, I'd like to, and I know a lot of people who would like to have that. Yeah, so yeah, so you've got a marketable product right there, boy, if you could. Find I have it. some um, yeah. uh, piezo material. Uh -huh. They could change the resistance based on the load. Yeah. I don't know if that would work. I don't know what the drift is. I have yeah. some sitting in my desk for the last year or so. I bought them for no reason. So uh -huh. we can try that. Huh. Do some testing. See what the drift is. And what's nice about those is they don't compress. Because okay. they compress like nanometers. Right? Okay. So it's yeah. like a. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, huh. Long lasts forever. It's more immune to noise than uh, strain gauges. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, so yeah. we can uh, huh. try that out. Temperature? Do you think would affect them if they're sitting outside? Uh, good know? question. Yeah. yeah. Probably. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, well, strain gauges too. Strain gauges are really temperature dependent. Oh, is that right? Oh yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, of course, sure, because the metals. Yeah. 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 I think yeah, I think the ones that are based on eBay have they have a built-in PCB. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, what we do at the office is we make a uh, load sensor basically out of optics because strain gauges are very bad for the applications we look at. Because uh -huh. they're basically antennas. Uh -huh. little, okay. right? And yeah. it's measuring the change in resistance. So you're putting a little current in there. So any yeah. RF that picks up will screw it up. And since yeah. we're doing a very, very small stretching of the metal, mm -hmm. so the temperature dependence is huge because okay. that will also uh, wow. change the shape. Sure, yeah. Huh. Okay, well there's a there's a business right there. <laughs> you can keep that price. And and there's a I know there's a big market for that, a big potential um, I I had to just out of curiosity I started thinking, okay, so what what where does the weight come from in the beehive? And so inside you've got basically honey or brood or bee bread which is going to become Brood food, which is going to become brood, which is going to become bees. <laughs> That's basically honey and bees. And those things come from nectar, which becomes honey, which is either eaten by the bees or harvested by the beekeeper. The feed that you feed is eaten by the bees. Some of it's stored, but you don't really want it to be. Water is brought in, cooled off, and it cools the hive and makes vapor. Pollen becomes bee bread, becomes brood food, becomes bees. Wax is just ignored. And then things that leave the hive are honey, water vapor, carbon dioxide. Be poop, dead bees, swarms of bees, and the energy they put into things. But and the varro? Pardon me? The varro that sits on there? The mites? The mites did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I ignored mites, I ignored, uh, I ignored propolis, I ignored, I ignored a bunch of things. And, and yeah, there's and not all the lines are connected. Or not, but it was just just a yeah, just to think about it a little bit. Okay, um, this guy Wyatt Mangum. If you read um, some of the bee magazines, he has a column. And he just has a new book on uh, top bar beehives. But at one of the talks he gave, he said the amount of brood is the single best measure of colony health. When bees keep their brood at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, about 35 centigrade. So, so by measuring by sticking a bunch of temperature sensors in the brood area, an array of temperature sensors, you can measure the brood volume. So that seemed like an easy thing to do. This is the way I started. 
I got a Radio Shack indoor outdoor thermometer, took the outdoor one apart, put it in a Radio Shack toolkit box, put the sensor right up there. Actually, I tied it to the wire with a piece of thread and the bees ate the thread. Um, but then the indoor outdoor, this, this is the outdoor reading and that's the indoor reading. So that worked real well. The bees very quickly, didn't, they didn't have any problem accepting that. Um, and every night before I went to bed, I would, I would go in, uh, I'd write down the current temperature, which is this, this uh, red, it looks purple on this screen, this, this dot here. And you can see this, again, this is for a year. Uh, that heavy purple dot is right at 95, and then it drops down to room temperature and stays there until uh, early in April, pops up to 95 again, more or less, and goes along. So you can easily just see brood, no brood. That's very, very clear. That same uh, device had the daily uh, maximum and minimum, and I reset it every day, so I got the hive maximums. And, and this was quite astounding to me, what these maximum temperatures were. Uh, it's like, what? Bees can do that? How can bees get a temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit? 100 degrees? 150 degrees Fahrenheit. They they generate heat with their with their flight muscles, and they they keep the brood at 95. But if if you think about, you know, how does how does this place keep warm? Certainly at the furnace, it's a lot hotter than than the room temperature here. And, and I think they the bees have their thorax right up against the temperature sensor to get readings like that. And you see over here, it doesn't happen like that, and that's because I changed. To that other temperature sensor, uh, the other thermometer, but so you don't get that discrepancy between maximum and minimum anymore. And then uh, this is the outside temperature uh, in, in the evening. You can see uh, that's that's winter time in the Washington D.C. area, <laughs> not very cold, and that's at night. Um, and even, oh, let's see what else is there. What else is interesting? Oh, this this struck me as interesting that even in the winter when the when there's no brood, there were times during the day when the temperature was up about 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which means that you can't just take one reading and have that be your daily reading. You need to take a bunch of readings and average them, or a bunch and make sure they're all within the same range, or something. It's not just a simple take a reading and that's it for the day, even though you really only care about what the daily reading is, because you only care is there brood there or not. But but it's not as simple as just taking one one read. And do you think your new sensor does the average automatically? It was it, what it was was instead of being the wire out exposed, it was embedded in a circuit board, <clears throat> and so it was further from the bees. Yeah. 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 Um, and I don't know if you can see it down here. Uh, this is where the, the sensor is. This is the black box down here. The wire went up to that spot there. And you can see it's 135 on the sensor and 68 in the in the room. Just just in case you thought I was making those numbers <laughs> up. <laughs> uh, then this is a, an infrared thermometer, a handheld infrared. The trouble with this thermometer is it reads on the surface of the plexiglass, not down inside. So so what I had to do was take readings at the same spot uh, over time and correlate the actual brood temperature with the, with the surface of the plexiglass temperature. And that way I knew that on average 85 Fahrenheit is 95, 85 Fahrenheit on the glass is 95 Fahrenheit in the, in, in, in the, in the center of the, of the brood. And that way I could monitor the temperature at all these other points just by going around and collecting that data. And um, I still do that uh, once a week uh, now, every Sunday morning typically. Here's, uh, here's an example of that data where you can see the hive looks like it's full of bees. Um, but here's the 95 degree mark. So these are the 16 uh, points, and those are the 16 spots there. And you can see that down in this corner, the temperatures are lower. And back in this half here, the temperatures are higher. And then up in the two corners, the temperatures are down below the down below the plane there. So, so you do get Quite a quite a variety of of of, um, of, of 
you know, you, you, by basically by measuring that, you can tell what the brood is doing to quite a lot of, of detail, but probably more detail than you need to know. That, that's, my, <laughs> that's my conclusion. I think in the end, the two sensors are enough. Yeah. Here's some wireless, uh, R, that's, these are RFID sensors with, um, with uh, Wi-Fi that I got from a company in Colorado. Um, so here I've got one, these are the two uh, boxes that are sending data to this receiver, which is attached to my home computer. So I put one sensor right in the middle and one out on the edge of the frame. If you're for the beekeepers, you know that if this is the frame, that they fill this, they typically start filling in brood in the center and go out, um, not all, typically all the way out to the edges of the frame, but typically out to an arc about there. And if you put your second sensor anywhere on that arc, when the frame is full, it will reach 95. There. So I think two two sensors is probably enough to to know when the when the frame is full. Um, and here's here's one day of data from those two sensors from midnight to midnight. This is the temperature sensor in the middle of the frame, and you can see they're keeping the frame the temperature right at 35 degrees C, which is there's brood there. And then over on the edge, you can see they're keeping the temperature very stable, but it's not. Uh, but there's no brood there. It's too cold for brood. So what are they doing? Well, there's brood nearby, but but it's not. But it's the frame isn't full yet. And then you can see here, starting about um, kind of about 10 o'clock, I guess the temperature increases gradually up to root temperature, and then drops off and takes off again. So what's going on here? Well, the bees were running around, warming themselves up, exercising their flight muscles, and generating heat in the air. And it dropped off because they swarmed. That's, a, that's what a swarm looks like. That was a swarm day? Huh? That's a, a swarm day? Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I, didn't, I was just trying to monitor brood, but, you know, this... This tells you that they they swarm. <laughs> oh, I didn't know temperature sensors is a swarm sensor. Okay, whole new idea here. Yeah. Uh, but that's what they did. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to put 60 days. This is one day. I'm going to put 60 on one 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 horizontal line here. Okay. So uh, right here, that's the day they swarmed. April April April. No, that's the day they swarmed. April 7. Okay. Well, you can see that, that most days they have a, a high point, okay? And that's because every day, or almost every day, the young bees uh, go outside for orientation flights. They go outside and practice flying. So, so they still have to warm themselves up to, even to do that. And so that's, you can see these orientation flights all the time. But there's only one other time when the temperature got all the way up to 95, and that was when the, a second swarm came from that high. And that, at that point, they left a non-viable queen in the hive. And so there was no brood. And you can see that the temperature in the center of the frame, where the brood was, is just now just the same as everywhere else. They're not maintaining that temperature. So you can tell, this tells you that hive is queenless. And that, that shows right up there very nicely. And then there's a whole bunch of mysteries. Like, what's this? You know, What's that? Yeah. I mean, don't know, don't know, and and nobody's gathering this kind of data. So so you can go look in the in the scientific literature for this kind of stuff, and you won't find any answers. So so there's all kinds of good stuff is going to happen once you start putting sensors in hives. All right. So imagine if you could get daily reports of the quantity of brood and the location of brood and the location of brood problems. And this is for brood in the summer, but in the winter you'd know where the cluster of bees was. Are they and where I live, the bees will sometimes starve because they'll be in a cluster and there'll be honey right over there, but they can't, it's so cold they don't want to break the cluster to get over and get to that honey to keep them, to consume it and keep themselves warm in the winter. But this would tell you the movement of that winter cluster. So here's the fantasy uh, for the four hive beekeeper who's monitoring brood volume here, just using the temperature sensors, but, but processing that data to see it as brood volume. And here we are from January to the end of April. And for these four hives, 
Three of them are doing just fine in terms of brood volume, but we've got one hive that's not doing so well. That stands out really, uh, really quite nicely here. This is the hive you want to go inspect. And maybe this one you want to check because suddenly they're, they're losing ground. And then here we've zoomed in, and again in fantasy. Um, so we've got for each frame of the hive, we see the last week's data and this week's data. And you can see some, some of the brood is increasing <coughs> in some frames, and some frames are full. And here's the average for the apiary. You can see on the, if you assume these hives are facing east, you can see on the north side of the hive there's not as much brood there. So it gives you that kind of intro too in, in fantasy, right? So maybe someday it'll actually happen. But I think there's a lot of possibilities. What do you need? Cheap temperature sensors. You need a way to collect that data, to send it to a collector somewhere and then process it and make sense of it and get it for every hive we've got. But we're assuming sensors on every frame, really cheap sensors, cheap disposable. Um, probably not RFID, but somehow a, a battery, if something could burn honey and create electricity, that would, <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Um, two summers ago at the Eastern Agricultural Society annual meeting, I invited every bee technology researcher I knew in the world to come and, and, and present their information. And six of them actually showed up, and three of them were interested in the audio. So, um, so uh, if you're a beekeeper, you know that the sound that the bees make changes over the course of the day, over the course of the season, over the course of the year. It changes from high to high, changes if they're queenless, and, and so on. Um, this guy Woods was the um, created this thing called an apidictor. This is his his tube-based circuit <laughs> for for making an apidictor, um, which is um, it turns out Woods was the the audio guy for the uh, BBC Symphony, the BBC Philharmonic. So he had a really good ear. I don't. But, but he, would, he would take his apidictor and walk up to a beehive, listen to the sound with his microphone, and then he'd quack the hive and listen to the sound. And given those two sources of sound, he could predict um, a swarm up to 10 days before the swarm. So that was, that was really good information. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, uh, Jerry Bromenshank is a bee researcher. He's, um, he has a patent on um, uh, the pre detecting the presence or absence of Varroa from the sound. And at a recent um, uh, meeting, uh, well, at the, at, the, uh, at, at the workshop I had, he was walking around with a, a microphone on a, on a stick. And he would put the microphone inside the beehive and listen to capture the audio. And then he was using machine learning to interpret the audio. And he said he could tell if the hive was queenless or not, if it was African bees or European honeybees, if it had varroa or not, um, and, and, and three other things. There were six different things he claimed that he could, he could detect from the audio. Um, and Brundage also has a patent. This, this was very simple. He just put a microphone at the entrance to the hive, and he was he claimed he could tell the amount of activity. Well, his patent was for detecting the amount of activity from that, although there wasn't really any information about how he did it in the patent application. Um, this is a uh, Ferrari, is an Italian audio researcher, and she. This is kind of silly, but it's, it shows you. This is the frequency that within the hive. You can think of that like from the low notes on a piano to the high notes on a piano, and how loud they're all they're all being played at once, but at different degrees of loudness. And so this is the measure of the loudness. And if somebody knows more about this and can explain it better, then you're welcome to do that. But she took um, she said this was so there's night, day, and swarm periods here. So this was the the nighttime pattern, audio pattern, and she's got that over here. The, uh, the red is the daytime audio pattern, and then the green is when they swarm. And you can see there's 
The day and night are more or less similar except in the amount, but this is a different peak and this is a different peak. And so those things uh, were what happened is the bees were preparing to swarm. So this is great for knowing that the bees have already swarmed, <laughs> but, but the, it doesn't really help you much um, beforehand. Um, this is a um, um, Cornell at uh, piping, yeah. Yeah, pardon me. The piping, yeah. I was just okay. wondering. Yeah, I heard that they do piping sounds also inside their in, when the queen's inside. Yeah, the queen inside the cell does piping sounds. Yeah, yeah. But this is worker piping. It's called quacking. Yeah, uh, there's two kinds. Yeah, quacking is one, and the other. Piping, piping is the queen outside. That's. Uh, okay. Queen. Outside, okay. Yeah, and. Cracking is inside, oh, okay. which is still inside the cell. Yeah. Okay. Um, but this is worker piping, and she's she's detecting worker piping for what up to an hour before the swarm. So it's probably when you saw the ch the temperature rising. That's probably the worker piping during that that time. But uh, that that seems like that's a very good um, good way to know that a swarm is coming. And if you're within an hour of your beehive, you can run over and <coughs> prevent the swarm. <coughs> this is Tom Seeley's lab. That's what that was. And you can see she's got a video camera and her finger. You can see her finger on the screen. Um, this is my version of audio capture. Uh, I put on the outside of my, this is my observation hive on the left here. I put this um, screened entrance on the hive mostly to improve ventilation. So then the tube goes out the window from there. Uh, but then that allowed me to put the microphone close to the bees without having the bees get it all sticky. But here I tried to put it inside the hive, and they, they quickly chewed through the plastic and started adding propolis to the microphone. Which is not, not <laughs> um, but this allowed the microphone to be free of uh, bee, <laughs> bee stuff. And then I had. This is a, a, a tiny laptop. It's the one laptop per day laptop, the $100 laptop. I had, I had one for a while, and I had some kids write some software that would collect 15 seconds of sound every three hours. So that, that's what I used that for. Do you process the sound and um, extract some data from it, or you just take the raw? I captured the sound, and okay. that's as far as I got. Uh, here's an example of what it looks like uh, one day at 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that previous slide that showed uh, a range of frequencies only went up to one kilohertz, so it just stopped there. Mm -hmm. Now, if that, that person probably knew more than I did, so probably all this is waste, but it, it came on the, on the frequency analysis software. So. I heard That's that uh, like, these under, the, under nine days old will flap their wings at uh, the key of A. Okay. And like because their wings haven't parted yet, uh -huh. and then after that they'll flink, they'll, the the older uh -huh. ones will vibrate at another frequency. Uh -huh. okay. But is there a way to differentiate, or is it just one big mush? Well, you can see each of these are very different frequencies here. So each of these is at a, each of these peaks is at a different frequency. Yeah, you do so a so. conversion from time domain to frequency domain. That way, the different frequency shows up as spikes. Yeah, you get the energy at every different yeah. frequency. Could so you can tell like how many like could you use it to tell how many bees are in the hive based on like possibly. how loud? Possibly. You could do that correlation, right? You could by knowing the number of bees that emerge every day and, and gathering the sound, you could figure you could do the correlation see. You could answer the question with an experiment. Even with the male, right? Eh? The male they have different and there's not a, always the same amount of male in the hive. Yeah. Yep. So this was probably going to do the sound, and they go and leave at a certain period of the day, and yep. it's probably going to change. Yeah, the lots, of, lots of variety. The air temperature might change it, whether they're fanning to cool the hive down. There lots of things. Um, so this is 6 o'clock in the morning. Then three hours later, whoops, wrong way here. <coughs> 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and then 6 o'clock again. Uh, I'll go through the whole thing again one more time. Did you try different windows for your handing window? Your uh... I did not. I didn't know enough. I mean, I, the software has the capability, but right. I, I didn't know. I didn't have any reason for changing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the how big of a the, hand, the, the handing window. You can change all these things, but I, I just didn't know enough to 
I mean, I had no reason to do one, to pick one or another, so. Okay, but I think six, nine, twelve, I think they took a siesta there, three, and then at six there's no, they're noisy again and there's lots more peaks. So, so you can see how using, um, breaking down the frequencies, using machine learning to correlate the behaviors with the frequencies uh, has a lot of potential. Um, but, but, but yeah, you have to do that work, and, and you have to do it with a lot of hives. And, and possibilities are endless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's some things that other people are doing. Uh, Wayne Asias, who's in Maryland, uh, has Honey Bee Net. He's getting people, volunteers, to manually weigh their hives every day. And when they start putting on weight in the spring, Okay, that means that dandelions are out in, in my area, and, but it's the first time that there's a nectar flow. Okay? And he's correlating that with satellite data from the MODIS satellite, which he gets for the whole world. Okay? So, so by having that correlation from, from tens or maybe now hundreds of local beekeepers, he can now tell you wherever you are within a day or two of when your bees are going to start bringing in nectar. It's really amazing when they're going to stop bringing them. Um, so that's if you go to Honey Bee Net, it's a pretty interesting website. Um, the Bee Informed folks <coughs> survey beekeepers, and they're trying to. They, they're, I think their hearts are in the right place. They're trying to survey beekeepers and gather the data and correlate, you know, the use of different insecticides, different herbicides, different beekeeping practices with what works and what doesn't, and feed that back to beekeepers. That's a way of gathering data and, and, and giving it back again. Uh, Roman Schenk is the guy I already mentioned, <coughs> who does a lot of automated monitoring. This is one of his beehives, so you can see the temperature sensor there. And Soybean Net is a, a U.S. government uh, tool for monitoring soybean diseases. They gather, the data is gathered manually, but I'll show you how they share that data, which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, this is the, um, the, the Bee Informed survey results. And this is, a, this is a good example of a bad, something's, something's just wrong. Either the data is wrong, or the analysis is wrong, or the presentation is wrong. But they've got summer losses, winter losses, and total or annual losses here. And they don't add up. <laughs> and they don't add up to 100%. And I'm not sure why. And then the respondent ratios, I'm not sure what those are, you know, and then they talk about significant differences and they don't do any significance tests. So, I mean, as a, as a beekeeper who wants to learn something from this, it doesn't help me at all. It just leaves me confused and it's useless. But their, their hearts are in the right place, they're collecting data, they want beekeepers to learn, and they're, they're giving the, the results of their surveys back to beekeepers, which is great. And if you think about if there was hive monitoring that was cheap and everybody could do it and we shared the data, the kind of stuff we could learn would just be wonderful. But <laughs> we're not there yet and they're not there yet either. Did you yeah. ask them for the raw data? <coughs> Pardon me? Did you ask them for the raw data? I did not. No. Uh, recently they sent out a thing saying, uh, if you've got any suggestions for how we could do this better, please let us know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could, I could give you some. This is the Soybean Net uh, website, and uh, so you can see there's red and green squares here. And what they are is where they have checked the soybean fields and there's no problems, or they checked them and there's a problem, or they checked and there was a problem and now it's not there anymore. And you can see it's mostly in the U.S., but some in Ontario and some down in Mexico. So what you can do here as a consumer of this information is you can pick a, pick a period on the calendar, you can pick a crop, you can pick a disease, and then you can see what's going on there. So you can hear a soybean farmer, that is very useful information. Um, you guys are not making me cry, it's that I have an eye drop. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's the kind of thing that we could do with, with, with high monitoring. Well, that, that the one, but there's uh, in Quebec, uh, the most thing that they're using in this week to monitor is the uh, the, the hive beetle, uh, that would be really uh, helpful in that way, but now this uh, green parenting is being really followed uh, closely. 
Uh -huh. It doesn't seem it's going to be a problem soon for Quebec because okay. we're excluding most of the import and export for okay. that. Okay. But uh, otherwise, like I really like which which uh, the disease could be useful for. Oh, uh, for something like the American fowl brood, yeah. which would kill the hive, and uh, you know, getting it so that all the neighbors knew of that problem mm -hmm. would be very helpful. Um, yeah. Yes. And it's really uh, damaging. Uh, Bacteria that is really strong. But I wonder how, yeah. how like it rusts for sure. Rust spreads like uh, like crazy. But I wonder yeah. how was the pattern. If it yeah. yeah, we yeah, yeah we can see if there was a pattern. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, uh, talk a little bit about networks. Uh, who's doing the research besides students? Is retired engineers. Uh, yeah, this is what you got to do. Every, when you get a new hive of bees, you got to glue up. You got to glue an antenna. Uh, talk about um, uh, image interpretation, uh, pheromone detection, and a few other things. Um, it's it's one thing to put a sensor in a in a beehive and you've got a wire connected to it or even the Wi-Fi, but if that apiary is out somewhere, you've got to gather all the data from every from the highs and all the data from the apiary and get it to the internet somewhere where a beekeeper can connect to it. So all that information gathering and transmission, those are not solved problems yet, at least not for, for beehives. And all along that, that path there is, is a power. And then you, if, if the sensor needs power, uh, if the transmitters need power, so there's a, 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 a communications and power issues everywhere that, that, are, that are pretty tough. A lot of beekeepers are already using electric fences from bears. So yeah, are those are electric, often solar powered. I found much cheaper power to use than electric fences. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, Yep. Usually with bees with the sun, yep. so solar power sort of works. Yep. It would seem to, solar would seem to be a good solution. Yep. So, yep. I mean, sensor doesn't take tons of wattage. No, it doesn't. Um, I mean, it doesn't. But you we need to get power from the solar panel in, into the sensor. And if the sensor's in a frame in the hive, I mean, you, need, you don't really want a wire there. So it, it's, it's tricky. I mean, it, it, you know how like a, like the, the foundation is wired. Yep. But what if the wire is the sensor? Could be. Could be. Yep. Yeah. Somebody suggested if you put a a wire there and you run a temperature along it, that but but you run a, a, a current through it, that it would give you you could compute the average amount of brood that the what. Yeah. Hmm. It would tell you something. You're using about, the wire that's already. In yeah. The, to to oh. tell you what. Because either it's going to be 95 Fahrenheit or not, and if you could use that, you might be able to, to estimate the amount of brood from that. Yeah, from the wires in the foundation. Yep, possibility, possibility. Yep. Um, so, so lots of companies claim they have solved this problem, but they haven't solved it for beehives. But but people are thinking about it. Um, Here's, uh, th these are the, like the retired engineers. These guys are using, both James Sorensen and Stephen Engel are using some one wire system. And that's a good intermediate thing, right? You use, just, use the wire, uh, figure out what, how many sensors you need and so on. But clearly manipulating frames or moving them from hive to hive, uh, adding and removing boxes, all that kind of stuff, it's going to be a lot more complicated if you've got a lot of wires there. So, so wireless would seem to be the way to go if you can possibly do it. Okay. Ernie Becking is a retired engineer who's in my local group. He has a manual uh, scale, but he weighs uh, about 40 hives in uh, three different locations uh, about once a week. So he's collecting quite a lot of data on, on these hives as a, on a weekly um, basis. But it allows him to say, OK, for this bunch of hives in this location, um, you know, some of them are gaining weight and some of them are losing weight and what the average is for that, for that little apiary. And they're scattered, I think, in the north and south and roughly in the middle of one county. 
So they're all within 40 miles of each other, and there's still quite a lot of variation from, from place to place. So, now he's the guy who told me, and, and I've since heard it's a general thing, that, that your knowledge about bees is good to the edge of your bee yard. <laughs> it generalizes to the edge of your bee yard after that. Not really. This is a PIC32, was a, one of these wire uh, sensor board, and this guy, the, the PIC32 people have competitions, and this guy was a beekeeper. I couldn't get any contact info for him. He was apparently a retired engineer who uh, did a lot with this uh, PIC32 sensor. And, and the website, if it's still active, has a lot of info about what he did, the hardware, the, 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 the software. Lots of videos and things, and, and that, that PIC32 is an open source. There's the Apiscan B counter. Um, this is another uh, good example of something that worked at, at one time. So basically, the bees go in and out through little holes here, and either there's a physical wire or two uh, photo sensors, or even just an electrical, you know, like a I don't know, like a stud finder that knows when something has passed nearby. Um, but what that prevents is it prevents bees from cooling the hive by fanning. It makes it hard for them to bring out the dead bees. Um, so it's, it's okay as a temporary researcher solution, but it's not, oh, and it's 2,735 euros. <laughs> <laughs> as they say, a low cost activity counter, right? So, <laughs> so, 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 I mean, you can buy one today, right? but but you can't put one on every hive, and, and and you'll notice it's only for a few frames. And the the same guy, a uh, makes one for sale too, and he said he could only use it on on nuke boxes, five frames, and again only temporarily. He said the bees had a lot of trouble controlling the temperature. With, with I don't really time. understand like practicality because bees don't just go in. The Oh, they like hover, like this in the middle, so you just, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so here's, here's what I think is a better solution. Uh, yeah, so this, this uh, researcher actually, um, I forget her, forget her name, but oh, Lily, Lily Mummer. Um, uh, she published a paper here, and there's a YouTube video there, but she put a, a camera here facing down on the, on the, on the landing board. And here's the view from the camera, right, looking down. And you can see the bees flying in and out. And she used a cheap camera. She used image processing software to count the bees coming and going. And I exchanged emails with her. She said that um, because of the cheap camera and her, her goal of having no artificial light, things like shadows are a real problem for, for, for image processing software. But she was able to deal with it. But then notice the shadows of the bees are, to, the, to a cheap camera, look a lot like bees, right? <laughs> and, and when you think about what a, what a bee counter would do, is it has to know if the bee is coming or going. And her, her processing software had a lot of trouble knowing one end of the bee from the other. So, and, and the bees all look alike, right? So if you say a bee in one frame here, and in, in the next frame there's a bee there and there, which, which one of those was this bee. And so, so it, it's not as simple as it seems, um, but you can see that a higher resolution camera might, might, might help. Was the camera taken still? It was a video camera, so it's like from frame to frame. Okay. I found the solution this week. Ah, good. Okay, well, you got it. I mean, it's this. a Carnegie Mellon uh, Kickstarter project. Uh -huh. It does 50 frames per second at 640 by 480 with full tracking and color recognition. Really? And, and it's and it's all embedded in this semi-dollar camera module with an Arduino <coughs> cable. Wow. So wow. it does all the complicated stuff for you in there. Wow. And, it can actually, and it, they said a 30 miles an hour object in one frame would be here and the next frame would be one foot over. So. Wow, I guess that's faster trying. than these components. Yeah, yeah, so I think yeah. we get we actually track where these are going. Wow, wow, oh, that would be. Good. And this is a Carnegie Mellon. What's it called? It's the CMU Cam Five. CMU Cam Five. It's wow. called the Pixie. P I X I. Wow. Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can order now, and it arrives March 2014. Okay. Wow.
Ah, so I there's somebody's graduate project. But yeah. I think just even the image, just to see the amount of these, like mm -hmm. you can yeah. use the count, and that, that would be even be just yeah. some value, I think. Yeah. yeah. It's also data that you can extract to see viability. Yeah. OK, so, so um, count the bees here. You're late. <laughs> <laughs> One more try. <laughs> um, this is just for fun, but yeah, it's, it's really hard to do. Even if you stop it, it's hard to do. Where are they going? <laughs> okay, they're coming out the bottom then, I guess. Uh, like a top view. Uh, top view. Oh, okay, top view. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking down at out the window at my at the high one like that. Ah, okay. Yeah. Right. Oh. Uh, but just think if you could do that. I mean, you, it tells you something about <coughs> flow, right? It tells you if the, too many bees, I mean, you always lose some bees every day, but if you're losing suddenly an increased amount, it would tell you that there was a disease or a, a poisoning going on. It tells you something about colony strength, something about the initiative of the colony. Uh, if you had the resolution to see that they were gathering pollen, you could infer things about the brood size, pollen availability, robbing, swarming, bearding, undertaking, drone counts, pests, predators. With an infrared, you could know if there were skunks or raccoons bothering your beehive at night. You know, just, I mean, there's a lot of info you could get from putting a camera there and having automated. Uh, Is there a way to measure like sunlight hitting the roof of the hive? Sure. Yeah. 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 It's called a movement. It's a yep. Movement. Yep. So it's like, I see like if these technologies are not used like alone, like if they're like used in concert with other, like if you have full sun hitting the hive and then you have a decrease in these going out, then you see a problem, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yes. Yeah. Once you start correlating things, yeah. 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 Um, I want to know your conference in November and in Cam. What's it called? You can as university. Okay. Yeah. University of Quebec and all that. We did a two-year study on some farms, and we manually tracked the amount of uh, nectar and flowers, the amount of sugar and flowers. And it did day to day, we actually went out and you know took samples of flowers. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And we okay. Yeah. So they said, okay, then then we realized how many bees were going to these flowers, and suddenly. These flowers bloomed and their nectar count went up. Even though these flowers still had nectar, but there was more volume of these flowers, and the bees decided to shift gears and go to these flowers. Because the nectar count went up. Mm -hmm. And these ones went lower, yep. but they bloomed again in a month after, and then they, the bees returned to there, and they left those, even though they, they had nectar, but they decided to go back to those ones because they had to huh. And that was very interesting, but it was. You know, flower and just, you know, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> but I don't know if you can maybe hmm. use technology to figure that out. Huh. It's like a Zilpi. It's a, a Zilpi in the Netherlands. It's quite a small one. You could certainly correlate the hive weight gain with the number of. Uh, returning flights That's, might give you enough info. Yeah. Because your 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 the weight that you were getting was like a daily. Uh, that's what I was getting. Oh, right. But so it's different than you seeing really like uh, sure. live. So you can oh. really see more. Of what, oh, you can see sure, that yeah. swarming. Uh, yeah, you can you can detect when the with an accurate scale. And I've talked to beekeepers who've done it. They can tell when the bees leave in the morning. They can see the difference between. When the bees stop coming in at night, so the hive is full of nectar, and then overnight they evaporate the water, and they can tell from the amount of water evaporated how much nectar. And of course, there's an overnight, there's a daily weight gain, and then an overnight weight loss, and so there's just there's a lot of detail available. And if you have a fine-grained uh, weight measurement, I mean, it, it really makes a difference about the things you can get if you measure. But if you, when you weigh, I mean, you're all on scales, so if you actually pick them up and weigh them. No, they're on on electronic scales. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, <laughs> yeah. But if you have a 
a scale that reads to a very, very accurately, and you read it very frequently, you can get a whole lot of information. Whereas if you weigh it once a day, every day at, before you go to bed, which is what I do, then then you get another kind of information. Just just it's, you get something useful, but it's a lot a lot cruder. Um, bees bees communicate with each other by pheromones. Imagine, I mean, when the NSA wants to know what Al Qaeda is doing, they put in a cell phone system and give everybody a cell phone and listen in on the phone calls, right? Now, what if you could listen in on the pheromones? What, bees have got 15 different pheromones, right? What if you had a pheromone detector that just told you what the bees were saying to each other? They, they communicate by pheromone and by, by feel. That's it. You know? um, I don't know if I haven't even thought about communicating by feel. Maybe a, a robot bee that went around. There's an electronic nose in itself. Yeah, yeah, there's a few. Yeah, I've got, I'll show you one in the next slide. Up. Yeah. E nose, yeah, electronic noses. Yeah. Um, but, but imagine, imagine if you could tune into the bee's pheromone system and just, you know, the hive is, they were saying the queen is getting old or uh, we need more feed for the, for the, for the larva here or it's too hot, bring in some water, whatever it is. You know, they, if you could tell that kind of stuff from the pheromone system. Um, but there is, it's a very active area of research. What you need is a molecule that will respond to the molecule that you're trying to sense, and then a way to, 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 to get that molecule and then to clear the sensor again. Uh, this is uh, something that I found, the Serrano's 320 handheld instrument, which has been around for a while. It's just a commercial, a commercial thing. They've got a bunch of uh, research publications from industry and, and from the medical area. Um, they, what they have is an array of sensors, and each of these sensors is sensitive to a slightly different molecule uh, or, or set of molecules, and then there's some conductive particles embedded. So when you give this a complex scent, okay, each of these sensors reacts in a somewhat different way, and by interpreting the pattern from all the sensors, you get a unique uh, response. And they show here, these are four different perfumes, and they do this, um, this, this dimensional analysis. This is again using machine learning kind of stuff. And the four different perfumes, every sample comes out in a slightly different place on the, in, the, in the space here, but they, but they tend to cluster so that they can identify the perfume by the sample. Um, and then there's another one here. This is uh, five different Coca-Cola, five different cola products. There's Coke and Pepsi and uh, Royal Crown, Select and Shasta. And you can see the different colors here that, 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 that I think they sampled it nine times. And you can see the colors tend to cluster in, in spots. So again, it's not a perfect thing, but this is a commercial off-the-shelf technology that senses something and it's pretty broadly useful. Whether it would work for beehives, I, I don't have a clue. But um, but I was I was surprised to find something this far along because previously when I looked for this, did my internet searches for e nose electronic noses, what I found was one one researcher in um, uh, Holland who was trying to tell when cows were fertile. Okay, now bulls, bulls know when cows are fertile, but, but farmers don't. But cows are inseminated artificially, and so knowing when the, when the right time to do the artificial insemination is very important to farmers. And right now the, the failure rate is very high. So if they could tell when cows were fertile, they would be much better off. Um, and they can't do it. And the researcher said he could almost do it consistently in the laboratory but it was very far from being able to do it in the field. But these guys, I mean, this is probably in a laboratory, but still, it's just a commercial product, and they're, they're able to tell samples pretty well. So, so I think we're a long ways from pheromone sensors, but it's an interesting thing to, you know, to think about. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. The other thing is, you, when I asked beekeepers, what do you want to know? One of them said, where's the queen? 
tell me where the queen is in the colony. Where is the queen? Is. I said, well, what if you put a little metal tag on the queen? You got one of those, uh, you know, metal detectors and held it up to the hive. I wonder if that would, if that would work. I don't know. Is that, are they sensitive enough? Could you do it that way? <laughs> it seemed like something that was worth investigating. Um, and, and right now you could tell um, just from temperature sensors when the drone comb is tapped. I don't know if you guys use drone comb. But if you do, you need to remove it before the drones emerge. Otherwise, you're just breeding mites. And what you want to do is take it out when it's capped but before the drones emerge to, to, to take the mites out. Um, so that, that seemed to be a possibility. And then I asked the question about how could you monitor things? And somebody suggested, I'll oh, train the bees. You, yeah. <laughs> bees make good, bees can sense this stuff. <laughs> train them. They are training bees. <laughs> Pardon? They're training bees already. The cancer, the rats, and yep. the, the spot the mines. Yep. Yeah, Bromenshank is the guy who's doing the mine, uh, the mine sensing stuff. Yeah. 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 The, the army turned out to not be that interested. The, the bees could detect the mines. The trouble is the bees only do it on nice sunny days. They don't do it in the winter. <laughs> they don't do it in the dark. They don't know what's cold and rainy. So well, what would be interesting is also because bees, um, just like people are studying bees as zoo sensors, mm -hmm. uh, zoo? as basically using um, animals or insects as ah. sensors. Ah, okay, yeah. So yeah. the thing is, is that bees have, they bring so much information from their environment. Yeah. Um, so if Using this technology to monitor for beekeepers, but also yeah. for other things. Yeah. To monitor is there uranium ah, that you yeah. can you can use that to detect because uh, yeah. it'll end up in the flowers. Like the flowers will bioaccumulate okay. toxic, yep. toxic yep. Yep. and bring it back to the hive. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I think the um, what's the um, laboratory in um, San, is it Sandia Labs in New Mexico did some experiments with. You know, if you're downstream from a nuclear power plant, um, downwind from a nuclear power plant, if you if you took samples from the beehives there, you'd know what was escaping from the power plant. So if they were doing some clandestine, you know, nuclear weapon development there, you know, you might be able to pick that up in the in the pollen or the nectar or whatever. So that kind of but environmental sensing, basically, yeah. That's a great way to do environmental sensing. Uh, OK, so I talked about what? <coughs> monitoring feed consumption, monitoring the weight, monitoring the temperature, monitoring the audio, interpreting the video, uh, detecting pheromones, a whole bunch of things here. Um, thanks. That's yeah. <laughs> um, That's sort of my personal perspective on things, but I've got this colony monitoring website. Where I'm, where I'm sort of gathering what other people are doing and putting it all in one place so you can find it. Uh, this is a, uh, yep. Um, the Brindage patent? The Brindage? Yeah, a Brahmin Shank. Bra uh, no, not Brahmin Shank. Oh, Brindage, yep. Brindage. Yep. Does he have any applications? Does he have any products it's in the market? Probably, no, no. And when I looked for this guy, he has a lot of patents. He apparently works for a, 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 a he says, it seems to be a smart guy, but he's working in a completely different industry. And, right. and so it looked like it's one of those things where they've got a whole patent process. And, and they, they do a lot of patent work, and they do a lot of that kind of stuff. And this was just something that occurred to him you know, one right. Saturday afternoon or something. And, and so he's, he's holding his technology back from the rest of us. Um, <laughs> if, he, if he enforces it, um, which he may or may not. And when were they filed recently? Uh, I'm, I don't remember. I think in the last 10 or 15 well, years. Yeah. I was reading that there's a state, I'm not sure state it is, but they patented um, hive monitoring. Like just in general. Yeah, like yeah. hive monitoring. It's okay. there now. Okay. Yeah. 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 That may not be, I mean, the patents have to be enforced, and they have to be enforceable. Otherwise, they're, they're, they're worthless. I, mean, I, I, have a, I have a patent, but the, the, the company that patented it for me, the company that owns it, is, has completely changed their business. So I know they're never going to enforce that patent because it would never occur to them to even think about it. You know? so, um, and when I worked as an engineer uh, in a ball bearing factory, I saw things that were patented that were physically impossible. I mean, they were, really, it was, 
this thing, one of them was a thing called a baller bearing. It was a combination of balls and rollers, but it would, it literally would not turn if, if it had been made. You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't turn. It, but it was <laughs> anyway. So <laughs> if you haven't seen that before, <laughs> this, is, this is a New York. <laughs> You can now buy T-shirts with this on it. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's the yeah. so that's my part of this. So questions or <coughs> do we have a second question? Uh, yeah, I'll do it. Oh, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it quick. I want to present some. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll just this is um, <laughs> so you're here on. on we can close the panel. Yeah, with the BPD. Show me that we can uh, put it on that. Can you wait a minute? Yeah, we'll take a two minute break here. Yeah, washroom break, I guess. Coffee for, coffee for anybody? Uh, yeah, please. Yes? Okay. Uh, Fine. Just left? All right. Yeah. And yeah. LJ is in the back. Long, short, strong. It's an espresso machine. So. Uh, one espresso. One espresso. Okay. Anybody else? Coffee too? Please. All right. It's a special. Nice oh, right. I'm very happy to be here. It's, it's, it's a lot of respect. Very good presentation. Yes. Cool. Yeah, real stuff. Yeah. Real stuff. <laughs> it's a lot of patience gathering all this data and like getting see with it, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's just it's fun to play with it. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of there's a lot that can be done. You know? mm -hmm. Just a lot that can be done. Um, and the technology is, you know, it's almost, it's there for it, people. It's very close. It's yeah. So yeah. Yeah. This, uh, I, half the time I spent working on this was trying to find the cheapest uh -huh. thing that worked. Uh -huh. uh, I'll, I'll mention a couple of those things in the top, like things that okay. uh, some people try to put together wrong, where there might be pitfalls. Uh -huh. There are a couple of things that uh, were at hand. Okay. Batteries are heavy. Yeah, this yeah. Their batteries are awful. Yeah, um, well, I'll tell you, when you're, when you're, the temperature sensor in your hive stops sending because of the batteries are dead, yeah. and it's December and 20 degrees outside, you can't go out and open the hive and take the frame out and mm. change the battery. You, yeah. know, you just can't do that. So, there's a couple, yeah, there's a couple of things that, uh, everything working together. Uh, although I, I found that there's uh, a bunch of things that are perfectly suited to this kind of application. <coughs> the, the amperage is just right, the voltages are just right. Uh -huh. If you choose the right things, you okay. can put together and it'll work okay. pretty, pretty quickly without too much money spent. Wow. So I'll, oh. I'll start with oh, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's great to see somebody who can actually do this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> do it. Yeah.